Welcome to this, uh, this seminar. My name is Neil Jock. I'm the host of this series on US foreign policy. Very pleased that Ellen Leipson is able to join us today. Let me make a brief announcement about the next presentation, which we'll, we've moved from October 30th to October 31st. It's uh, by Tom Finger from Stanford University. He'll be talking about uh, uh, the um, intelligence demands in general, but uh, more specifically, we asked him to come and talk as a consequence of the revelations from Edward Snowden, the activities of uh, the NSA and so on. So I think a lot of people would have questions about that, but we have moved that from October 30th to October 31st. The reason we did that was to deconflict with another very interesting talk that the Institute for Governmental Studies downstairs is hosting, uh, former Representative Alan Tauscher and also former Deputy, former Assistant Secretary of State for International Security will be speaking on October 30th. And I know that uh, I would want to make sure that people would be able to go to both of those. So we tried to deconflict it by moving Tom Finger to the 31st. But it will also be at the same time here. Alan Tauscher will be speaking on October 30th in the Banatau Auditorium over in Sudarcha Dai Hall, which is on the opposite side of campus at the north end just near um, Hearst Avenue, and she'll be talking about arms control issues, which is what her responsibility was uh, most recently in the first uh, Obama administration. So let's go ahead with um, uh, this presentation. I'm very pleased that Ellen Leipson has been able to join us from Washington. I've known Ellen for quite some years now. We've sort of followed similar paths. I wish I had followed hers as carefully as she did, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful career. Uh, she did a, a, her uh, education at Cornell University and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. She then started the Con Congressional Research Service, and I encourage students who are thinking about work in Washington to think in terms of CRS, which is an excellent way to get a toehold in Washington, and also to learn a range of issues, also to learn both the good side and the bad side. Uh, we won't talk about the bad side of working for Congress. But in any case, it's a good start. She then moved into the intelligence community. Um, she was uh, then uh, moved along rapidly within the intelligence community. Uh, she was the national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. She was also at the State Department Policy Planning Office. I cite those both because those are both jobs I held as well, but she moved on to more brilliant uh, future. <laughs> Um, she then served at the United Nations as a special assistant to the U.S. Permanent Representative from 1995 to 1997. And then she ended up as the vice chair of the National Intelligence Council from 1997 to 2002. In 2002, she was offered the job as president and CEO of the Stimson Foundation, which she took, and she's been in that position for 11 years. The um, Stimson Foundation was uh, lauded by the MacArthur Foundation, Foundation recently as one of the um, outstanding non-governmental organizations for their um, influence in Washington. And it's a good example of how we see a policy being influenced and, um, and made even uh, outside government and outside academia. Uh, NGOs are a, a valuable bridge between academic life and policy world. And Alan's in a, a particularly good position to talk to us about, about that bridge and the experience she had both in Washington, how that affects her work as the president of the Stimson Foundation. So, Ellen, thank you very much for coming to Berkeley, and please join us. Thank you. Well, thanks, Neil. It's really a pleasure to be out here. It's such glorious weather, and it is California, after all. So escaping the East Coast is always a good thing to do, particularly when the US government is behaving as badly as it's doing right now. Um, so my topic is uh, perhaps a slightly irreverent question, since I'm very much part of the non-government sector, and I guess so are you. Um, you know, does, does the knowledge, information, ideas that are generated outside of government make its way in useful, appropriate, and effective ways into government deliberations? Um, so it's kind of a question that I, I think I have a preferred answer to uh, based on, on my own career, and both Neil and I have, you know, gone in and out and clearly believe in public service and believe that the government needs uh, smart citizens to contribute to their work uh, one way or another. So I think um, the topic is, is a relevant one in part because we all as citizens share a desire to see our government be effective and to be based on wise and, and appropriate information. Um, that we also believe that when we're part of the non-government world that generates information and ideas and policy recommendations, that at least part of the mission of even the academy, the academy that may be funded by 
taxpayers at the state level or at the federal level or be privately funded, that at least part of the output of the academy and of other non-government research institutes is for the public good. And so there's some convergence of, of goal here. Um, I would argue, since the topic is, is m more about foreign policy than, than other topics, that because the international environment is so very challenging right now, and we have to admit that US power and influence in the world are on the decline, uh, it's appropriate to ask the question again, um, does the knowledge, information, and ideas that are available to government make a difference in this period of, of transition, I believe, in America's role in the world? And then we all, and you'll be hearing this from Tom Finger and others um, in, this, in this series or in other talks here on campus, um, we're certainly well aware of some of the limitations of intelligence or, shall we say, the excesses of intelligence that are likely to be curbed, that the pendulum swings back and forth. We are still living at the tail end of the post-9-11 surge in our government throwing enormous resources at trying to counter the counterterrorism threat, and now an appreciation that that had, a, that had its own downsides, and maybe it is time to recalibrate the level of effort that is made within government to collect information on that particular topic. My interest is much broader than terrorism. It's how, does, how do non-government experts support a much wider menu of foreign policy topics? And I, I think, actually, that's an important thing to say right from the outset, that where non-government experts can sometimes be most useful is on topics that are not the number one topic of government's preoccupation. If the government has decided that a particular topic, chasing al-Qaeda, fighting the Soviets, worrying about the rise of China, is the number one foreign policy topic, they will dedicate a lot of resources to that question. The non-government experts can actually make it the greatest contribution to everything else. Um, they will also be invited to contribute to the debate on whatever is the number one or number two topic. But I think in particular, and I've seen this in, in my own work, that sometimes the contribution is valued the most when it's on a topic that the government is not dedicating a lot of resources to. So as I said, Neil and I, I think, have a stake in this topic because we see how the relationship between public service and non-government expertise has shaped our own careers. And I think our, either our bias or our reason judgment is that the relationship between non-government experts and government is a positive one and can be a very effective and productive one. So my goal this afternoon in a few remarks is to examine this notion and to assess you know, how do we think it's working and what uh, can be done uh, to improve it. <clears throat> I'm taking very much a qualitative and interpretive approach, not a quantitative approach. I don't think anyone in Washington or in a university uh, could ever collect comprehensively all the data that might be relevant to understand how the federal government interacts with universities, laboratories, think tanks, federally funded research uh, centers. It's an enormously complex architecture of relationships. And I, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever tried to catalog it all. Um, and I think if you ask the government, they wouldn't know where to begin, because it's very separate, independent funding streams. It's sometimes relationships that have existed for decades, other relationships that are much more um, ad, ad hoc and agile. So it's an, it's an interesting concept of whether a, a smart graduate student would like to take a crack at it. But I think we, I'm hoping that we will at least consider today both the formal funded transactions that are institution to institution, as well as the countless informal consultations where non-government experts are treated in Washington in a way as a public good. I, I perceive this in running a small nonprofit um, that our experts are called on and we're always quite thrilled to be invited to brief a high-ranking person in government but it is also the case that this is um, not the same thing as when the government uh, funds a university to do 10 years of data collection on a particular topic. So we've got a, a very wide spectrum of relationships. Uh, so why don't we start on the government side? So I, I thought I'd take this sort of from the two perspectives. Um, how does the government look at these relationships and, and maybe how do people who participate in these relationships perceive uh, that, that interaction? 
So, you know, what does the government need? I think increasingly very smart people go into government either as a career or as a short-term association and quickly learn that we have created institutions that are so absurdly complex and self-referential that you spend a lot of time in government talking to other people in government about processes. It's a, I heard a wonderful line recently about marriage that I think is perhaps relevant to this, which is that marriage is a, an institution for the adjudication of problems that otherwise wouldn't exist, okay? <laughs> so government exists to hold meetings with each, that we create complex structures that, ref, that are self-referential in a way and that sometimes lose a sense of the, the larger purpose or the larger mission. And very smart people in government then bemoan the fact that they don't have enough time to think and they turn to people outside of government and say, you've had time to think about this, please, please tell me what you think we should do. I feel that there is a, a sense of, uh, quite frankly, humility of people that are serving in foreign policy positions right now that are painfully aware that their jobs are either highly operational, highly transactional, uh, very you know, program-oriented staffing visits, staffing uh, travel of a principal uh, decision maker, and much less time for developing big ideas to staff out what might be a major initiative in the Middle East or, or somewhere else, et cetera. It doesn't mean that thinking isn't going on, and when the, you know, the White House led policy deliberations are held. There are very sophisticated papers drafted for those meetings. It's, I don't want to in any way trivialize what people in government do, but there is gen, generally an impression that the bureaucratic life takes on a kind of uh, self-absorption and a dynamic where people spend a lot of time um, working governance processes and not necessarily focusing as much on the substance as they wish they could which means that there is reliance in a curious way, at least in, in parts of our system, on these informal mechanisms to consult with, uh, with non-government experts. Um, so people in government, they need a full suite of information. They need um, you know, tactical knowledge of what's the adversary government thinking and doing. Um, but they need to understand the politics, not only of, of the country or region they may be working on, but on the constraints on the U.S. side of what's the political mood towards a particular problem or region or country. Um, we, they have to monitor the press. They have to, you know, someone in government has to be constantly gauging uh, what is the level of interest in the American public in, a, in an insatiable media machine that expects uh, maximum transparency and maximum access to the most you know, incremental policy decisions and changes. Um, so people in government are constantly in interacting with the outside world in, in ways that feel sometimes a little bit defensive um, and that are just triaging from day to day, and they're not always in a position to say confidently, we know that five years from now that we're going to transform this relationship to, with China to look like uh, the following thing. So um, I, it's my impression, of being in Washington for now more than 30 years, I feel it very much in the Obama administration as compared to the um, Bush administration that there is a desire to turn to non-government experts for, to augment the thinking part of the, the, the policy-making process. Um, I can't tell you how often I have heard Obama administration officials say, um, you know, we don't have all the answers. If you have good ideas, please let us know. That there's, an, there's a, a hunger and appetite for, um, and you know, for the most part, ideas that are perhaps at least compatible with the worldview of the administration, but they're not just reaching out to people that they presume to be sympathetic to their worldview. They do want to consult with a fairly wide range of people. Um, so I think we could, let me just take two examples. Uh, there was an Egypt task force long before, um, sort of in the first year after the fall of Mubarak, uh, and I actually think the Egypt task force existed. About five think tanks got together and their senior Egypt scholar, they created a very small group, less than 10 people, um, bipartisan, 
and um, they started visiting on a regular basis with the White House and saying, you know, you got a big problem. You've, it, and this, I think, was right before the fall of Mubarak, but it, it has continued through these terrible, this roller coaster that we've been on with the change of, of government in Egypt. And so the White House folks invite this group on a fairly regular basis. It's now a trusted conversation, very informal. Nobody is you know, committed to following the government's line. Um, sometimes the people on that task force then show up on the PBS NewsHour and you know, talk about the advice they've given the government. Everyone is very free to maintain their own um, point of view. But I think it has been uh, largely productive. There was a juncture after this July coup in Egypt where I think the Egypt Working Group was very exasperated that the Obama administration didn't shift its policy more dramatically uh, towards the Egyptians, uh, you know, in, in terms of the big question of cutting aid. And eventually, and so some of them publicly criticized the administration and said, you really do have to, this is unacceptable by our own legal uh, definition of how we're supposed to conduct our foreign aid programs. And so it, there's no guarantee that that level of access and that level of uh, consultation uh, guarantees a convergence of worldview, but I think that was a quite productive example. Um, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Policy Board that was created by Secretary Clinton. She created it in part because she knew that um, uh, the Defense Department had one and she wanted it. So the Defense Department for many years has had a Defense Policy Board that meets several times a year and they meet as, a, as an elite group. They talk to themselves. They consult with people inside the Pentagon, and for a few hours for e at each of these meetings, they would meet with the Secretary of Defense. So we met maybe four or five times with Secretary Clinton in the last years of her uh, tenure as Secretary, and Secretary Kerry has continued it, so we just spent a day with him um, right before he was leaving for Geneva. And so that's another mechanism, 25 Americans from either you know, public policy world, some are heads of major humanitarian NGOs, some are from the business world, some are former politicians. Very interesting, diverse group of, um, we're now about 25, um, to give feedback to the Secretary of State on uh, part of the agenda is set by the department. So the department says, here are the topics we want to talk about. Here's what we're doing. What do you think? So it's soliciting feedback, a very mutually respectful, I think relatively healthy. Um, occasionally in the aftermath of this latest meeting, the secretary said, um, you know, I really would like you guys to give me some ideas about additional things we could be doing uh, on the Arab Spring. And so we've written a memo to the secretary. So there's, there are existing mechanisms where I think information flows and it's, a, it's very much a, a reciprocal um, process. There are, um, you know, and, and here at Berkeley, I was uh, seeing earlier some of the important scientific work that was done here that had a very profound impact on national security. Over the decades, it's clear that the government has turned to great scientific minds to develop the, the R&D side of national security systems. Those relationships have existed for decades. Some have been considered to be very sensitive and secret relationships. Some have been much more overt and public. I think we can acknowledge that those exist, but a little bit put those aside. And I think I'm talking more generally about the, the, more, um, tact the more tactical political consultations that take place for faster moving crisis kinds of foreign policy decision making, not for how you know big research institutes support the development of, um, of science applications for either weapons or other technological applications. But that is certainly deserves to be acknowledged as one of the ways in which our government um, engages. So there's a new academic project that I'm involved in that is being run out of MIT and um, Notre Dame on looking at the track record of academic affiliation with government. And they're looking at the Minerva Project. The Minerva Project is a, a big funding mechanism that was created in the Bush administration to sponsor uh, academic work in the social sciences where major grants would go to universities to essentially for multi-year um, 
collection of empirical data on very specific problems, on very specific issues. So it might be, I don't know, counting extremists in a, in a group of countries or trying to do some uh, polling or sociological research on a, a problem in national security. Um, so that's a new initiative that is post-Cold War. Um, when the Department of Homeland Security was first created, they, uh, they dedicated a rather substantial amount of money to create centers of excellence, and they had competitions across the country among academic institutions, and, con and universities were told to work in coalition. So just to make it as complicated as possible, you would get 10 universities together competing, you know, or coming together as a group to compete against 10 other universities in consortia of various kinds. But they did it very smartly. They were, it was all about terrorism. It was all about the safety of the American public. So they went to Midwest state colleges of agriculture for food security questions, for sort of biosafety questions. They went to some you know, consortia of colleges in the Northeast to look at the psychology of terrorism. They picked different disciplines, different groups of universities, and that, I thought, was a very successful enterprise. They did not guarantee that it would be sustainable funding. So if a university gets a surge of you know, $10 million for a few years to work on a particular problem, uh, and then is somehow supposed to turn that into a sustainable business model, uh, I'm not sure it would be interesting to look back and see how many of those centers of excellence are still flourishing or how many have you know, essentially um, had to um, scale back when federal funding was no longer available. But I thought that was a, an interesting and, and useful um, uh, form of engagement with non-government experts. Um, so, but I think the dilemma that all of us in the non-government world face is how do we know if these interactions are making a difference? How do we, are there any appropriate metrics or ways to evaluate? Sometimes you get the, the loveliest feedback of, oh, this was so helpful and I used it in a memo that I wrote to the president. Oh, that's great, that's, it's, it's nice to get that feedback, but it's still sometimes not always clear whether that insight from more independent, non-government experts uh, did actually make a difference in the decision that was taken. And I think here we have to always be aware that you know, the experts care about their topic. They don't necessarily have the same antenna out for all the other factors that go into government decision making, which could be you know, upcoming midterm elections, it could be the state of the American economy, it could be uh, the relationship with countries adjacent to the country in crisis. So I think that the outside experts sometimes have their own uh, blinders on. They believe that, you know, the future of Egypt is in and of itself um, a very compelling topic, but U.S. policy to Egypt may have many other variables involved, and I think the outside experts are not always um, sensitive to that, and they become frustrated that they don't see the results of their, of their contribution. Um, so, let, so that's, I think, important to kind of switch gears now to how do the outside experts see their contribution. I do sense sometimes that outside experts are quite disgruntled, that they've tr shared their wisdom and they don't see it reflected back in either public pronouncements or decisions that government makes. They want the access and they want to believe. Did you have? Did okay. they get the level yeah, of the, feedback like we already, like in, other, in other words, there's all these independent uh, people trying to think outside the, the bubble. You haven't used mm -hmm. the word bubble, but uh, there's, there's all these non-governmental trying to think outside the bubble saying, have you thought of this, have you thought of mm -hmm. this? Did they ever get the feedback, yes, we've thought of that? Yes. No, oh, yes. I mean, and frequently, and I will say that when you go, and I was, that was actually a, a point I was going to make a little bit later, it is very humbling when you're in these exchanges sometimes and you are basing your judgment of what does the administration know on what they say publicly, and you get inside and you realize they have much more texture and nuance and complexity to how they're thinking about it. That's just not how they talk about it, okay? So they may already appreciate, you know, 96% of what the outside government experts think is important to know about a country or a region or a problem, but they are constrained in how they're going to talk about it publicly. So it is frequently the case that you know government people would say, yes, yes, we're aware of that, and yes, we've read what you've 
you know, what you have on your website. And yes, we, we know the um, outside experts that you're citing here, um, but there's sometimes the absorptive capacity is, is limited because the bureaucracy has to manage other realities. You know, there may be resource constraints, there may be uh, preoccupations with security, other things. So, um, uh, so I, I do think that we want to just be clear that the non-government experts want to both, they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to have great access and feel that they are contributing to government deliberations and they want to remain completely independent and free to um, uh, criticize or to support government as they, as they see fit. But they don't always appreciate that their field of specialization doesn't align perfectly with what the responsibility of the government actor is, that the government actor, so I, I do think that when you've um, been in a government position, you appreciate it's not that people are stupid, it's very smart people doing things that sometimes look stupid, um, but it's not because the person doing them is stupid, it's because there are uh, serious constraints on how uh, government behaves in, um, in, in the public in, a, in an age of tremendous transparency and in an age of where you know, there's a huge amount of, uh, the ratio of information that is available in the completely open world is much higher than it used to be. And the percent, so that the, the comparative advantage that someone in government has by access to classified documents is less important than it used to be. It's still important, and in some topics it's extremely important. If you're working on nuclear weapons, if you're working on terrorism, if you're working on the decision making in a very closed society, intelligence is still hugely important. But if you're working on you know, China's relations with ASEAN or the future of Indo-Pak relations, really a big chunk of that, that strategic analysis can be done uh, without reference to classified material. So I, I want to differentiate between topics in which the, the government has access to unique information and topics in which the conversation can be you know, quite open uh, between government and non-government um, experts. How many NGOs got clearance? Um, it's, usually the, the clearance is at the individual level, not the institutional level. Many um, NGOs do not want, uh, my NGO, does. we do not do any classified work. So individuals may have uh, clearances because of either past associations or because they've been asked to serve on a, on a board or a commission. But as a matter of policy, we uh, only do publicly, you know, open, publicly available things. Um, so um, I, let me make a few other just categorizations, if you will. Let's talk about think tanks versus universities. So um, uh, we've described a little bit the very different and very important roles historically that universities have played in contributing to a wide array of national security and foreign policy. Uh, let's face it, some of the regional studies programs at major universities were created to produce linguists and area specialists for the US military, for the foreign service, so that there is a symbiotic relationship that is a very long standing. Again, those very large institutional relationships, I think we should acknowledge that they exist, but let's try to talk about something that's a little more um, uh, tactical, if you will. Um, but I perceive, and I've now been in this think tank for 11 years and worked in the government's think tanks before then, um, that think tanks play a role that's quite different than uh, universities. There are plenty of people in think tanks that also teach at the university level, that have PhDs. There's certainly part of think tank culture that overlaps with academic culture. But I think what think tanks do that's different is that we are information intermediaries. I see us as, as um, uh, playing a mediation role between academia and government. We translate sometimes scholarly work into a policy relevant vocabulary. We, we, we uh, glean from longer scholarly works those parts that we think are germane to whatever is the decision pending before government um, at a given time. And we, I think, work, we, we try harder than academics do to speak in a language and a vocabulary that, is, uh, that can be used by um, public policy decision makers. Um, 
It's not to say that there aren't academics who are great at this. Joe Nye from Harvard. There's, there's many, many examples of very uh, gifted um, political scientists and academics who, who moved very gracefully into government and could speak the language. But it is also true as a regional specialist, my own background is on the Middle East, um, that some of the academic work on with, that represents very deep country knowledge is not absorbable by people in government. It's just too deeply detailed, it's too historic, it takes too long to get it published. There's many reasons why think tanks play a, a, a different role than academics in feeding information uh, to the policy process. Um, and then there's also the issue of independent think tanks versus publicly funded ones. Now, I personally think this isn't a big issue in the US because the US has the, so you have FFRDCs, federally funded research uh, and development centers like the RAND Corporation, and those have their own, you know, there's their, their own culture and their own way of interacting, particularly with parts of the military. But I think in general, most think tanks, whether it's Brookings, Carnegie, somebody smaller like uh, Stimson or many others, because of the role of philanthropy in American society, think tanks, even if they accept government money to do discrete projects, they can maintain credibly their independence because they have very diverse funding bases. I think think tanks in other countries that are funded exclusively by a political party or exclusively by a ministry of a national government um, can never quite pass that credibility test of, of being truly independent. So I, I think this is less of an issue for the United States. Um, so um, let me get, go, switch to a, I was going to say, you know, can we answer the question, is it working, is it getting better? And again, as I said earlier, I don't think any of us can ever master the full sweep of relationships to make a, an aggregate judgment. We tend to know the story through whatever community we're part of. If we're Russia watchers, we can say, oh, 20 years ago, I used to get invited to brief the government more often than I do now. If I'm a China watcher, I can say, oh, I get invited to so many conferences now that are federally funded. They need me. They, need my, they want to talk to me every month. So people have very subjective experiences depending on what topic you work on and what, what community you're part of. Um, but um, I guess I believe that the flow of information and this embrace of this notion of public-private partnerships, which means lots of different things, um, suggests that it's a pretty continuous, porous relationship, okay? So I see a, a cultural shift to, um, it, but it's almost to the point where you can't measure it and you can't evaluate it for impact because it's so um, informal and continuous. It's a, it's a flow of information and relationships and conversations that's happening on a very regular basis. And given the information access that we now all have through uh, everybody's websites, you know, people in government can be reading, can be consulting us without us knowing it. They can be mastering what's out in the public domain, following the public debate, even if there hasn't been a formal face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. So let me just, I, I wanted to just give you a couple of examples of countries that I've, uh, you know, watched this debate, um, and then I'll, I'll finish up. Uh, on Iran, okay, so I've been at least part of uh, the Iran debate um, and watched the role that, uh, watched and participated in the non-government experts trying to nudge the government in one direction or another. And here, an important point is, is the non-government expert playing a purely informational role, or do they become policy advocates? And on the Iran case, um, I would argue that the non-proliferation experts very much took on an advocacy role, even if they didn't fully acknowledge it themselves. That the non-proliferation experts became, um, I think, a, a strong community that w remained very deeply skeptical of Iran's behavior and intentions. They are, they are kind of purists about whether Iran was meeting all the criteria that the IAEA uh, uh, demanded. And so even though they were enormously helpful in monitoring, I mean, parsing any 
international report that came out using commercial satellite imagery to mimic what the government intelligence agencies were doing to try to figure out what Iran was doing at various sites. I mean, the level of effort that has gone on on Iran in the non-government sector is quite remarkable. They have played a a surrogate or a shadow government role uh, that has, is in many cases very impressive, the work that David Albright has done and um, the Arms Control Association and others. But I would argue that they have veered towards an advocacy role without acknowledging it. Um, so they don't want to give Iran the benefit of the doubt. They, they are deep, deep skeptics about Iran's intentions and Iran's likely behavior. On the other end of the spectrum, we have former diplomats, Tom Pickering, Bill Lures, um, I think it's um, Jim Walsh from Harvard, or uh, there's both Jim Walsh and, and Steve Miller, they both uh, participate in this thing called the Iran Project. And these guys are unabashedly advocates. They're basically saying diplomacy can work. Um, we don't have to go to war uh, over Iran's nuclear program. There is a deal to be had. I've signed some of these. They've done a series of three documents on sanctions, on the pros and cons of military action, and the latest one has been the sort of comprehensive uh, diplomacy will work. Um, now, the danger, I, I, it's very thoughtful, it's very uh, enlightened thinking, it's based on a, a genuine belief that talking is better than fighting, um, and a belief that we have really, that it's partly our fault that we haven't tried hard enough to understand Iran, that, or to understand Iran's interests and Iran's point of view. I am sympathetic to their view. I am also aware that the White House sort of isn't listening anymore because these guys are seen as Johnny One Note, okay? So that there's always the danger that you lose your um, effectiveness as a, a non-government expert if you have a point of view that you are just relentlessly arguing. If you can't demonstrate that mm, disappointed in Iran this month, or gee, isn't Iran, this is very encouraging the way Iran's behaving this, if you can't show that you are adapting to new circumstances, but that you have an underlying point of view that you're just always, the bottom line is always the same, uh, the people in government will start to say, okay, I know what that guy's gonna tell me, I don't need to listen anymore. So there's that predicament of predictability, I, I would say. Um, on Egypt, as I've already mentioned, I thought the working group um, had terrific access to the people inside the White House who were truly struggling what to do about Egypt. They weren't satisfied that the White House was following their advice, but eventually the White House did um, the, the, the most recent cutting of aid, I think, is closer to what they were recommending. Let me just use Afghanistan as a last example. Um, this was an extreme case because of the level of the amount of money sloshing around, the, uh, the high salience of trying, scrambling desperately to understand Afghan society while our forces were in harm's way on Afghan territory, and our, I think, a, a genuinely deep commitment, at least for part of the years that we've been in Afghanistan, to believe that we could make a difference in helping Afghanistan build institutions, invest in the human capital of this country, help Afghanistan get on their feet uh, to build a more modern and just society. Um, but I think that the role that outside experts played will be looked at in the history books with some concern. Uh, there's a wonderful line, you know, General Petraeus was no fool. He cultivated the most outspoken Afghan experts and brought them under his wing in a very systematic and deliberate way to the point where the other military officers um, would call these PhDs who were hanging out on our military bases advising the generals, doctors without orders, okay? <laughs> so um, that these were the academic experts on uh, Afghanistan who were given tremendous access, who were embedded with the military, flying around, supposedly telling the general this tribal, you know, uh, you know, mufti, is from this particular, you know, advising them sort of on the anthropology and the sociology of Afghanistan, but to the point where they were very much uh, became cheerleaders of the American engagement in Afghanistan. They be, their own self-interest, their own career interests became very much associated with let's get it right, let's, you know, we can really turn this place around. And so I think they were, in, in the process, somewhat discredited. They were no longer playing the role of the independent outside expert. Um, 
there were other examples, I would say, that were more appropriate, where NGOs, not just Americans, and here I, I would credit the US military for being very um, inclusive. There were uh, British and Indian, and they were not, this, their seeking experts was not uh, on a US citizen, you know, they, they, you didn't have to be an American, a US national to be able to contribute uh, to the effort. Um, and, and so some of the work on good governance and effectiveness uh, was done quite well. I've watched closely the work of the Asia Foundation because I'm on their board in Afghanistan and the relationship that the Asia Foundation was able to demonstrate that we're an independent NGO. We you know, sometimes get projects that are funded by the US, but sometimes they're funded by the World Bank or the Australians or lots of other parties so they could play. They were mostly staffed by Afghans with only a small expat staff. Um, and they could maintain their independence from both the embassy, the US military, and yet also be partners um, on very important projects. Um, you may have seen a book by Valley Nasser, who's um, now the dean of SAIS, who spent about a year working for Richard Holbrook on Afghanistan and Pakistan, and then wrote what I consider to be a kiss and tell book um, that you know, he was absolutely thrilled to be inside government working on a, a topic of such high importance but then wrote a book that was totally unacademic in its uh, was very highly personalized account of how Holbrook, you know, only Holbrook could bring this problem to a close and the rest of the bureaucracy somehow undermined him and resisted him. Very, very subjective book that I think uh, shows a little bit the danger of uh, non-government experts being lured into government service where it's a thrilling adventure, and they a little bit lose their own uh, perspective. So I, um, that's uh, one thought there. So compared to the Soviet era, you know, in the Cold War, it was abundantly clear that what the US government most cared about was expertise on the Soviet Union, on Russian language skills, Russian history, et cetera. And so there was a whole community of people that were very much connected um, to, to government work. I think we live in an age that's so much messier now, where you don't know from day to day whether it's Somalia or Burma or China that will be the number one topic. And therefore, the non-government experts are never clear that their work is being valued or that they, there's any sustainability to their relationship with government. Um, but as I said before, the overlap of what we can talk about and the uh, the relative importance of completely open, unclassified work is greater than it used to be, and I think government understands that. Um, uh, a last thought, if we could just turn the prism one more time, how do non-Americans perceive the role, you know, the interplay between government and non-government experts? I do, um, I, I don't know whether it's amusement or, or sadness sometimes, where I see people in other societies misinterpret uh, US policy or US intentions because of their access to non-government experts who uh, assert very confidently that they know, you know that, that they can speak to US policy. So I think there is sometimes a cacophony of voices and a lack of clarity about who is speaking authoritatively and who isn't. Um, I want to end on a you know, largely positive note. I see a, a positive sum dynamic here. When used wisely, there's no question that um, our government officials uh, are themselves often genuine subject matter experts, but they need feedback. They need sometimes help in understanding the context, sometimes help in generating new policy ideas. Um, and I think our very open and very talented society has a great role to play here. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get the protocol perfect. I don't think we'll ever get the rules of the, the lanes in the road just right. But I think this is a very important uh, and largely positive way in which a very open and democratic society behaves. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I'm going to uh, open the floor for questions, and I'm going to bring the microphone around again. It's not so that we can hear you so much as it is for the um, recording. So let me open the floor um, for questions at this point. Uh, yes, sir. Excuse me. Sir. 
Um, in the interest of uh, transparency and uh, debate, not conversation, debate, I uh, prefer debate over conversation. Um, can you name the most Helen Thomas-like confrontation, and the most uh, in-your-face, you know, like, Carrie, you got it wrong. This is, you know, here's, you know, instead of just, like, walking on eggs and politically correct. Is my question clear? No. <laughs> I mean, but so that, that I've participated in th or that I've witnessed? There was a uh, presidential briefing uh, mm -hmm. lady uh, who was... Yeah, was she, Thomas. Helen Thomas, yeah. She was a journalist. Oh, you don't know her? I know Helen Thomas, sure. Yeah, so she was, do you understand in the face, the way it applied to her? So she was asking confront she was questions. Con she was confrontational. Yes. And are you asking, were there Name some top, confront the most confrontational, these NGOs have to give advice, like, did you know this? Did you know the government, Obama, did you look at this? Did you look at this? Did you look at this? Wh which one of those were walking on eggs? And which one of them were, you got it wrong, and you, here's some dots, you didn't connect these, and they, you know, you're really wrong. Well, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to answer your question directly, but I think you've brought in another important dimension, which is that journalist culture is different than the culture I'm talking about. Journalists have a very clear mission. It's to, you know, insist that our government uh, share the maximum amount of information, uh, and, and she was particularly talented at it. There's plenty of other journalists who would do it. When I talk about interactions between the Egypt experts in government and the Egypt experts outside of government, I'm sure there have been very heated moments where experts, and I'm not going to name names, and, I'm, and it's certainly not at an institutional basis, it's at, at the level of the individual expert, who were truly exasperated that the United States didn't call the July 4th action a military coup. And I'm sure they conveyed that. Did they do it in a Helen Thomas-like style? I doubt it. Uh, but you don't don't worry for a minute. I mean, even on the Foreign Affairs Policy Board that I'm on, people are very, very pointed. They say to the government, your Syria policy is failing. You've got to come up with something else. You know, it's not working. I have certainly witnessed many conversations like that. It is true that people in a certain level of society want to never be too confrontational. They want to uh, get invited back. They want to uh, feel that they have treated the other person with enough respect. So it's not a shouting culture, I would say, but there are certainly people defend their analytic positions with great passion. Uh, I just would add a little bit. I think the question is also, uh, to some extent, is it sort of a culture in Washington of uh, just being non-confrontational for the uh, sake of influencing and being, um, being chosen? And the answer is that that's not really the, the case, at least in my experience. And I, I cited my own experience as being comparable to uh, Ellen, uh, even though she's the featured speaker today. Because in my own experience, I've seen both from the president as well as at the uh, senior levels of the executive branch, they're quite open and quite welcoming of uh, people being confrontational in intellectual and policy terms. Um, it's not the same as when you have someone who's in a, in a certain sense, an adversarial institutional relationship with the government, which a journalist is. But when you're within the government, you've sort of signed on to say, I'm here to help solve the problem, and I may uh, disagree with the way you're going about doing it, uh, but it's done, as Ellen just said, it's not a shouting environment, it's, but it's very much on, on the basis of, is this policy going to get you what you want? Is this policy going to achieve the outcomes that you are that are consistent with your overall policy? And um, in my own experience, um, that's uh, very much welcomed. And, and certainly within this administration, I, I would cite someone like Dennis McDonough, who was the um, uh, what well, is the, now the chief of staff, was the national security advisor following Tom Don uh, or deputy. Uh, under Tom Donilon, was extremely open to uh, a whole range of views on how we should proceed in terms of policy, even when he knew that the people in, in the room, um, coming from a different uh, uh, perspective uh, in a different part of the executive branch, might be quite um, contrary to um, the policies that were being followed. So it's not, a, um, a, not an environment where people keep their mouths shut in order to uh, sort of achieve position. Other questions from the floor? Hi, uh, my name is Sandeep, and I'm an undergraduate here. Uh, I'm not actually in, involved in politics at all. I'm a, I'm a scientist. Um, but uh, just a question for you based on some things I've read. Um, 
So uh, based on China's foreign policy, I know that uh, one thing I've read frequently is that China, when they're making foreign policy, and re many of the reasons for their relative success is that they're not uh, focusing as much on um, trying to influence the, the social culture of a country or trying to bring about democratic values so much as trying to um, do more like a business deal. Um, do U.S. foreign policy makers um, feel that it is the duty of the United States to um, uh, promote our democratic values or promote our um, our social values um, in comparison to um, uh, other other needs such as like financial or security mm -hmm. no it's a great question and I do think that we will be um, you know uh, uh, trying to understand how different China's approach to its international engagement is compared to ours but I think that Egypt and the Arab Spring have caused a, a slight loss of confidence on the U.S. side that the promotion of values is, is effective anymore. You know, so is there a way? The U.S. has always played this somewhat unique role of, having, of pursuing both its interests and its ideals. You know, and this is, what's, this is what's unique about the United States sometimes, that other countries can stay in a, in a more coherent set of we just pursue our interests, that's all we do, that's what foreign policy is all about. But the U.S. has always had this extra mission, which is to promote what we believe are universal values. And I think the Arab Spring has been a, a very sobering experience where there's a little bit of a repudiation of um, the, the cultural and the values transmission part. I had a conversation recently with the new Iraqi ambassador to Washington who is um, I think quite close to Meliki, and he said, you know, we want the United States to help us build roads and build institutions, but you do not tell us how to, you know, what are the proper values between men and women or between religion and the state, you know, just that's none of your business. Um, you can, you know, help us build a competent state, but you stay away from trying to shape our society. And that's a real struggle for us because we have tried to do both. And now, I believe that the Chinese are a little bit um, uh, deceptive here. I believe they are also developing their own soft power. So you have these Confucian centers all over the world. They're teaching Chinese. They want people to believe that Chinese civilization is, you know, has global value and global significance. So they, we, we look at one level of their behavior, we say a mercantilist, you know, they're just looking for natural resources and energy requirements, and they, are, they couldn't care less about whether countries have a good human rights policy, and, you know, and, and they are outsmarting us on that because we, we damage our relations with countries when we are harping on them about democracy and human rights, et cetera. So, you know, do the Chinese have it easier? Well, I would argue that the Chinese are going to learn that they need soft power, too. If we, and they believe in their own soft power. If we look at their presence in Africa, they have very quickly learned that, guess what? The Africans don't appreciate being, you know, bossed around, or the Africans expect their big investment projects to also create jobs for Africans, not just for the Chinese. Uh, th you know, they're going to have to adapt um, to a global environment that is, um, that is very challenging. At the same time, the U.S. has to adapt. And I, you know, I do, I feel a sense of loss in a way that the U.S. may find that we have to scale back the way we engage in some parts of the world. Because if they, if they don't want us, if we're not welcome, we have to you know, uh, take that into account. My understanding was that uh, the Bush administration was not that open to people who disagreed with what he wanted to hear. Right. Uh, what was the atmosphere back then compared to what you're experiencing now? Yeah. No, thank you for asking. Um, it was certainly my experience, and I, I had served in the Bush the first year of the uh, George W. Bush administration, and I was in government, and one of my most positive experiences was the uh, presidency of his father, who I thought was really excellent on foreign policy. I mean, that was a, uh, the early 90s was, a, I think, a very impressive period of Amer the conduct of American foreign policy. Um, it is true, it was certainly my experience when I got to Stimson, which is nonpartisan and non-ideological, that the Bush administration, and, and this we really, let's be honest, it was Cheney more than Bush in many cases, very ideological, had their selected think tanks that were 
validators of their worldview, and they were not interested in what anybody else. Thought. I mean, I, we felt it strongly in our think tank. We could still interact quite well with working level people in the bureaucracy, sort of office directors, deputy assistant secretaries. But if you got up much higher than that, we were not politically correct in that time. So there was a period where the ideologically driven, and I should say in think tanks in general, you know, from the creation of the Heritage Foundation and now the democratic counterpart to that, which is the Center for American Progress, there is a great worry that think tanks, you know, that say they're independent really are highly politicized um, and that think tanks like the one that I'm at that are quite insistent that we're by nonpartisan, you know, have Republicans and Democrats on our board looking for people that have kind of moderate foreign policy views. Um, it's lonely in the middle sometimes when the debate is very polarized, but then the pendulum swings back again. And I think that's where we are now. But it's certainly my experience with the Bush administration is that they had their valid, their trusted validators in the non-government sector, and people who had different views were largely ignored. I wish I could make a case yeah. against that. Since I worked yeah. also in the Bush administration in somewhat more political environments, I was at the policy planning shop, which Alan mentioned as the <coughs> think tank within the government, and it was difficult to get different ideas. But sometimes I, I blame it on there being a fairly quick shift to it being a war government, a war administration. That after September 11, there was um, uh, a, a commonly held view, and it was certainly promulgated by vi the Vice President as well as the Secretary of Defense, but they did come to dominate the discussion. And so the, the, it pushed other views out of the room, and it tended to, to polarize uh, to the extent that the key issue was how we were going to deal with terrorism, and then that morphed into how we would deal with Iraq. And those, the, the, because it was kind of a war administration, it tended to push other issues off the table. And uh, it wasn't kind of uh, an open environment within which one would discuss the available options, because this response to 9-11 drove the thinking so, st so strongly. Uh, that's not an excuse, but perhaps uh, some, in some ways, uh, perhaps it was an excuse that some people were looking for in order to crowd deb debate off the table. But at the same time, it was um, uh, that's perhaps a more conspiratorial view of how things develop. Um, anyway, just an additional thought. Okay. Dr. Lapson, it's a great pleasure to have okay. you here. Uh, I want to take a minute and give you my view of NGOs when I was in government. Mm -hmm. And I want to preface that by noting that I was in defense and really on the acquisition side. That mm -hmm. is, I had to get certain things done. Mm -hmm. The NGOs were remarkably unhelpful. May not be their fault, but uh, I saw too many reports that I asked for in which I could count up the number of shoulds mm. and then count up the number of hows the shoulds vastly outnumbered <laughs> the hows. And yet my job, I knew what I wanted to do. Worse yet, my boss, Dr. Perry, knew what he wanted me to do. But the question was not what to do, but how to how get to it do done. It. Yeah. A good example would be working with Viktor Mikhailov, who was the Atomic Energy Commission in Russia. Uh, it was in the interest of Russia and the United States to carry out certain projects. And they weren't classified. And it was very, very difficult to find a way, whether I'd go to Russian scholars or political scientists, to find a way, how do I get Mikhailov to do the obvious? So that left me somewhat jaundiced. Mm. Then I, with some trepidation, because my colleague, Professor John Lowe, John Lowe is here, I would turn to the National Academy of Science. They would do good work, but the review of our process was so long slow. Yeah, that it was of slow. no help to me well, whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, what I like about your career and Neil's is that you've been in government and now you're out of government and you very likely could go back into government again. But you know the frustrations that I was living with at that time so that your advice, Neil's advice, would be much more on point. But the advice of those who haven't been in the cauldron or in the arena, as Roosevelt said, uh, just was a waste of my time and the country's money. Now. Am I just simply jaundiced by my own experience, or is there, are there some flaws here in the NGO world 
that could be fixed mm -hmm. by being more responsive to officials like myself. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't disagree with you that sometimes what the think tanks produce is not relevant enough to the, dis the actual you know, day-to-day -day business of government. Uh, but they, they're not very good at the tactics. You know, they, can, they can either validate or provide an alternative goal for what the US should, should be doing. And I agree with you, we try to be very careful about that preachy tone of you know, the US should. Um, it really, it's, it's sometimes hard to produce a quick list of recommendations without a verb that sounds a little uh, too normative. But, um, and we struggle with that. We know that that's an issue. But I actually think that we have to also accept where the kind of division of labor or the complementarity is. It is the role, the responsibility of the people in government to figure out the tactics. And in a way, maybe the ideas generation people on the outside are you know, maybe operating at a higher level of abstraction. I do think there's a danger that what we generate sometimes is sort of self-evident, and the hard part is the how do you make it happen. And that, but the how do you make it happen also does require you know, more knowledge of who's on the other, who's the, who's the party that you're negotiating with. And that's where you kick into information that the government has that the non-government expert may not have. I mean, the non-government expert may be watching, you know, I don't know the Russian players well enough, but you know the defense minister and sort of sub cabinet, they may not know who's in charge of procurement in the Russian you know, armed forces, or they, they may not know what people in government know by, at, at, a, at a deeper level of operational transaction. So I think part of it is to be realistic about where the NGOs add value and where they don't. Um, I thought you were going to say something else, which is that on procurement when it comes to weapon systems, that I think here's an area in which uh, think tanks have to be very careful uh, to do proprietary studies that are funded by the defense industry, you know, to me, starts to neutralize itself in terms of value. That these, some of these studies get discredited right from, even though they may be written by very intelligent people who have a lot of, who understand the complexity of the issue, but there are times where a study for a self-interested party is, to me, is not the role that a think tank should play. You know, I think we've got to be careful about that. So there are, there are functions within government, and perhaps your own experience would be one of them, where the contribution that think tanks make may be of, you know, of, of kind of marginal value. Um, and, and then again, I do think that we have to also be clear about when we're advocating for position and when we're trying to just give a kind of an evaluation and offer perhaps a range of options, but not be advocating for one single course of action. So. Let me just mm -hmm. say, too, um, uh, before we um, take a couple more questions, and then uh, that we will have a short reception afterwards. We have some wine and um, a cheese platter so people can stand around and chat among themselves, press uh, Ellen a little bit more <laughs> or me on issues that we raised here, or just talk among yourselves about the, the points that she raised. Um, so you're all welcome to join that as soon as we break, which will be in a few minutes. Um, I know there's another question, but let me ask um, uh, one other, and then I'll, I'll send the mic around. Can you talk a little bit more about um, uh, what you wrote in the paper that you sent me? And that's when NGOs, in a certain sense, become active in making policy or in helping policies make policymakers uh, reach out in policy terms, and that's through Track 2 activities. Mm -hmm. And for those who aren't familiar with it, Track 2 is uh, when uh, typically NGOs will spearhead um, non-governmental meetings with other non-governmental actors to talk about current policy problems with the intent of trying to facilitate a discussion about hard issues that are, have not been addressed at the policy level or to try and address um, uh, relations or issues between countries that don't talk to each other. So I know there have been tracked two activities, for, for example, with respect to Iran. Yeah. Can you offer your yeah. perspective? Okay, now that's a very interesting arena because there's, um, it, it actually gets initiated in, in a couple of different ways that I think lead to different results. Sometimes um, the government could encourage a Brookings institution, for example, you know, we can't talk to the North Koreans, but if you, you know, 
were in Geneva and there were North Koreans there and you could have a dialogue with them, we'd be very interested to know the results, okay? Um, so that it would be seen as quietly helpful to uh, people in government to learn the outcomes. There are other cases, and, and the liberal foundation, so the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the MacArthur, uh, I think Carnegie, have been funding a wide range of U.S.-Iran Track 2 activities for a number of years. And finally, these foundations, you know, and, and Tom Pickering and others that, you know, clearly were very unabashed in saying, uh, we've got to figure out a way to talk to these folks. We don't have to like them. We don't have to agree with them. We have to talk to them. Um, so these folks would go to, sometimes we had the Swedes as an intermediary. Sometimes it would be the Swiss. And there'd be, you know, you'd meet five times with various uh, Iranians who were either were perceived to have access to Iranian elites. And um, after a while, the foundation stepped back and said, you know, we don't think we've had any impact at all. I mean, you do it for a few years, and then you step back and say, did it help? Did it contribute in any way? Um, and in some cases, the Iranians that can come out are either, you know, they may be either they're people who are so outside of the loop of influence that it doesn't matter. They're kind of pro-Western, Western-educated academics who can go in and out without any trouble. Or they may be bringing information back to the people in power, um, but don't necessarily have, you know, that that's information that the Iranian system would absorb, but, but they would never have to give anything back in exchange. Um, so there was a, a sense of, I think, discouragement that we think we're doing the right thing. We hope that over time it will make a difference, but we have no results in the short run. We have nothing to show for it. Um, now, I've taken the view when our think tank is, you know, when we're funded by a foundation and are asked, you know, how are you going to, what are the metrics of impact that you're going to use? And so at the 12-month mark, you're supposed to be able to say, here's how I changed the behavior of North Korea. Or, here, you know, absurd expectations that the role of non-government analytic activities can somehow have that level of impact. We have to take the long view. You know, we have to, that some of the, this is building relationships. It's shifting thinking over time. Um, sometimes the great think tank successes, we didn't know they were a success until long after the funding was over, long after the report was filed and put on the shelf, um, but that it eventually triggered something. I mean, Stimson is very proud of the work that Michael Crapon, one of the co-founders of Stimson, has done on a space code of conduct. So he's been hammering away at this for 10 years. The US administration wasn't interested at all for a long, long time. So he went outside the US. He got the Europeans. Suddenly in Geneva at the Conference on Disarmament, they're talking space code of conduct. Lo and behold, sort of eight years into this project, the Obama administration decides, you know what, space code of conduct, we think we can live with that. You know, we don't want arms control in space. There's no stomach for big, new, complex arms control negotiations. But, you know, voluntary space code of conduct, maybe that's a smart thing. So, you know, if we had to report to funders eight years ago, we would have had to say, no traction. The U.S. government's not interested. But at a certain point down the road, it suddenly becomes the right idea. Um, but you can never predict the timing. And similarly with track two. I mean, we don't know if U.S.-Iran relations move to a different trajectory now. Will those track two activities have been absolutely feckless and meaningless? Maybe not. Maybe it'll turn out that Zarif participated, you know, that there was some human connection that was made that actually turned out to make a difference. And I wanted to give you another variation on um, what track two means to me. Um, we have a China scholar at Stimson that travels constantly uh, to China, Taiwan, and has written over the decades on US-China-Taiwan relations. He is, I call him, a you know, one-man rolling track two phenomenon. Because what happens, and here's where the Chinese are so much smarter than we are sometimes. When the Chinese are going to have a major state visit, where there's either a high-ranking American official is going there, and then this now would happen only at the summit level, they send 
their government-funded think tankers to Washington to kind of take the pulse of the think tank community. What do you think is going to happen in this meeting? What's the mood on the American side? What are your expectations? What, are, what do you think is... And they go back and prep their official who's coming to Washington. And the scholar at Stimson, it's very clear that he has a track record of, of sort of getting it right, of, you know, telling them in advance what the mood, you know, what's likely to happen in, in these meetings. Um, and I was in the foreign min the Be Beijing, we were meeting with a vice foreign minister once, and he, he told us, I mean, it was quite curious, it was quite stunning to me. He said, you know, of all the think tank people, Alan is the one whose track record is the best. So that they, they then go back and evaluate what are these Americans telling them and who got it right. A kind of after action exercise that the US intelligence community goes through sometimes, you know, looking back and giving themselves a report card. How, how did we do? And they don't always do well. Which, if you don't mind me digressing, I want to just tell one more uh, example of how, because I should have told this earlier, it's a wonderful example. Uh, when the government turns to non-government experts, OK, so after the Arab Spring, President Obama said to the intelligence community, and why didn't you tell me this was going to happen? You know, sort of like, what's wrong with our system that you guys didn't know this was going to So they then took that scolding and turned it into a huge internal exercise of you know, looking at 10 years of analysis and dozens of people on a task force reviewing every piece of paper that was produced over a very long period of time. What's wrong with our methodologies? What's wrong with our training? I mean, very self-critical exercise um, uh, taking to heart that, that maybe there was something they should have, could have done differently. Um, someone who's known to both of us, Peter Lavoie, was in the intelligence hierarchy at the time. And he came to me and said, what were the non-government? He wanted to do a parallel study. What were the non-government experts saying? So I got to do a 60-day. We had to turn this around in 60 days. This was one of the most fun things I've had to do. Um, what were non-government experts saying about prospects for change in the Middle East before change happened? Okay, so we took the period from 2005 to 2010, and we did it by information culture. So we did universities, think tanks, business risk firms, mainstream journalists and social media, and human rights and democracy advocating NGOs. So all of those have gather information about different parts of Arab society. Who was saying that change might happen or could happen? And then the other question they asked, which I loved, was uh, did they have a theory of how change would happen? Okay. So. Um, All those who didn't know what Bradley Mann told us. Did not. This was written in early 2011. The answer to Obama is we need more Bradley Mann. Uh, well, that's not my answer, but um, the, the truth was that if you had a theory of change, if you had one of these complex matrices that measured state instability, for sure you got it wrong. Okay? <laughs> Tunisia and Egypt were in the upper quadrant of stability. They were not in a high-risk category by any of the studies that were doing global you know, counting per capita income, demography, you know, food insecurity, what, price of bread, whatever, whatever you measure you wanted to use, they were stable countries. So if you had a theory of change, it was not going to help you. The people who did not have a theory of change were much better listeners, and the journalists did the best. The journalists got it right, because they talked to people, they were interested in the full spectrum of society. They weren't focused exclusively, people at the top, they weren't focused exclusively on political activists, young people. I mean, the democracy advocates were, were reporting very clearly, these kids are different than their parents. They're not afraid. They, you know, global communications technology has changed the culture. If you are 20 years old in Egypt today, you are different than a 20-year-old in Egypt was. You are totally different You're, in terms of your relationship to society, your relationship to the state. Et cetera. So they knew something was happening at the bottom. But they were not doing anything about how would Mubarak or the Egyptian military act. Um, 
the U.S. government analysts were only watching Mubarak and the military and could have cared less about what 20-year-olds were doing. Um, but the journalists were, had the most kind of full-spectrum view. Um, so to me, so that study, it was called Seismic Shift, Understanding Change in the Middle East. I, it's on our website. Um, that was a great example of using non-government experts to play off of an analytic exercise that was being done in government. So. And how did the intel community do? Well, I mean, I've heard a lot of different versions of how they did. Uh, some, depending on where you sit in the system, I've heard people say, oh, uh, we didn't do that badly. We knew that uh, Egypt was under a lot of economic stress. I said, irrelevant. It wasn't about economic stress. They're, it's very hard for them to make the sweeping judgment, just like at the fall of the Soviet Union. You had people in the intelligence community who insisted that they got parts of the story right. But did you get the top line right? You know, they're, they're struggling a bit with acknowledging whether they got it. Uh, you know, how, was, it a, was it a failing grade? Was it a C plus? You know, um, they know it wasn't a great grade, but they, are not, they don't think it was a total fail. They were interested in socioeconomic change, to be fair. They were, and they were certainly writing that Mubarak's team was stale and there was a stagnant, you know, that there was something sour in the political culture. It's not that they were uh, oblivious, but they couldn't net out the, the, the behavior of the Egyptian military with the bottom-up activism. No. As a former professional no. in the intelligence community, I'm inclined to use one of two uh, sports analogies. I could say, well, uh, judging intelligence prognostications is, you know, it should be like baseball, where if you, if you go out two times out of three, you're a big success. Um, or, but, but that's not the case. The problem with intelligence is that you only hear about the failures. And I'm inclined to say that it's more like the best free throw shooters, Steph Curry for local example, that um, uh, most of the time it's 90% plus, but that you only hear about the shot mm -hmm. that was missed. Yeah. No, uh, because fair. those shots that are, are, are missed, and there are a lot of good calls that are made. But um, obviously I'm picking two extreme examples, and I'm way defensive about that particular issue. <laughs> One more question, and then we'll adjourn for, um, for some um, casual conversation and the reception. Sir. Um, well, I thought the war the, is it on? Is it on? Yes. Yes. OK, yes. sorry. Um, well, in fact, uh, the, the last answer covered partially my question. Uh, I'm a visiting scholar here, and I work for uh, one of the specialized agencies of uh, United Nations. And then my question was related to the fact that perhaps in addition to what you said, uh, there could be a more expanded role. In fact, you partially responded. I was mainly referring to the case of Mozambique, where the peace talks were basically facilitated by an international NGO. And in fact, Mozambique uh, officers... Santigidio. Santigidio, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and Mozambique officers uh, keep saying that without uh, an NGO, without an external broker, they probably would have not gone through. Yeah. So whether this could be also something more that uh, you could took, uh, you, uh, you could think about it in terms of a role of NGO, whether the administration would be somehow mm -hmm. in certain particular cases able to, to accept, to mm -hmm. delegate even more. And then you mentioned about the fact that in the Arab Spring, uh, the journalist uh, got it right, according to that mm. study. But again, uh, could uh, that be uh, a challenge for an NGO expanding their own network? Uh, so helping the administration in addition to what the intelligence can do to, to collect additional perspective. Mm -hmm. When I had the chance to work in Iran, I was so surprised to see a totally different society than what I had mm. expected. I am a political scientist. so. I had a bit of information, but since we had to work, uh, we had a microfinance operation in partnership with a number of NGOs, uh, youth NGOs. I had the chance to have a very open talk, and I could realize the Western-oriented approach. These were people there, not mm. flying in and out. Uh, these were people who would uh, explain so well uh, that the nuclear issue was just a card played by the regime for its own uh, uh, purposes, uh, that for them it was... Uh, it was a problem because the, the work uh, to create uh, a bit of uh, uh, consensus to, to change things would mm. be damaged because the nationalist card was too strong 
and immediately the regime could have gained uh, uh, more consensus. So the fact that NGOs can also go a little bit more uh, in the way rather than, uh, if I understood correctly, a very valuable uh, think tank uh, mm -hmm. uh, exercise in Washington. Mm. So this St. Egidio example, I, I don't know uh, the early period of whether the Vatican, it's, it's a Vatican-related uh, NGO, isn't it? Well, yeah, church-related. Yes. Yeah, church yeah. mm -hmm. Of whether they did it at their own initiative or whether they informed key governments that they were planning to do it. So I, I do think there are cases where independent peace organizations try to launch a peace process at their own initiative and that governments sit back and wait. And if it proves productive, then the governments can val endorse it and say, this is great, keep going. Other times, what I see happening is um, the government having a goal and then asking an NGO to be the implementing partner, okay? So that it's actually a government endorsed activity from the beginning. So I think it can go either way. Sometimes it can be at the initiative of the NGO, and sometimes the NGO can be kind of the, the silent partner of the government. And, and I think it um, can go either way. Um, uh, the second question. Um, to, to network uh, with other, to develop other channels of information, perhaps, and networking with other local NGOs in order to get additional. Yes. Oh, uh, that is a big trend. Okay, that's a, a very good. That the a big trend is, um, I think, to partner with local civil society organizations. Uh, we do that quite a lot in the Indian Ocean region, where um, we don't want to presume that we can speak authoritatively to these other societies. And so the the trick is to get the right blend of of perspectives and make sure that you're you know bringing. And there is greater civil society capacity, you know, I would say in many countries around the world. It's also a trend in how some of the democracy promoting uh, assistance is now being conducted in Pakistan, for example. Big shift on the part of the U.S. government, which may be premature, I don't know, um, is to not fund American NGOs to do civil society work in Pakistan anymore, but to fund the Pakistani NGOs directly. And then those Pakistani NGOs sometimes say, we can't do this on our own. Can we partner with an American NGO to give us the, but the, the American NGO becomes the, the supporter, not the lead. And so that is, I think, a big trend. Um, and let's hope it, it proves to be productive. But I think when they, you know, when you start to have financial, that means we've got to very quickly train local NGOs to do all the financial management themselves because we've, you know, we're very uh, strict about some of, uh, of that stuff so that um, uh, it's, it gets complicated. Ellen, thank you very yeah. much for making a well, long Well, thank you. Time.